In this video, I want to introduce the concept of paramagnetism. Now, for all of my physics all-stars, I'm sure you're already familiar with magnetism, and you know that when you apply a magnetic field to a material, it can have a very stark effect on that material by applying a magnetic field. So what paramagnetism is, um, it's when a substance is attracted to an applied magnetic field. And what that means for us in chemistry is that this, this effect of a substance being attracted to an induced magnetic field is usually associated with the existence of unpaired electrons, right? So if you have unpaired electrons, that substance is likely to be attracted to an induced magnetic field. And the opposite of paramagnetism is diamagnetism, which is when a substance is repelled from an induced magnetic field. And this is associated with paired electrons, right? So, so what happens here is let's say we have a, um, let's just say we have an unpaired electron that's in some orbital, right? So it doesn't have to be anything specific. We just got some unpaired electron that exists in some uh, molecules electron configuration, right? Let's say we then apply a magnetic field, right? So we apply a magnetic field, right? Then the electron can change with respect to the magnetic field, right? So that applied magnetic field can alter the orientation of that electron, right? So we can, we'll just change that guy to spin down here, right? So it, it can actually change. But when you have paired electrons, right? So let's go to these two paired electrons, right? And we apply a magnetic field here, then it will have no effect on the orientation of these, um, of these electrons, right? It won't affect these electrons because they're paired. That energy of those electrons being paired will overcome the energy of the applied magnetic field, whereas a free electron has no such interaction. So, so if it's an unpaired electron that's present in a substance, then it will be attracted to an induced magnetic field. We would say that it is paramagnetic, right? So paramagnetic versus if we have all paired electrons and no unpaired electrons, then this is going to be diamagnetic. The material would be diamagnetic. Okay, so let's look at an example of the boron dimer. So this is B2. And this is its molecular orbital diagram, right? So we have the molecular orbital diagram for boron dimer B2. And you can see here for the boron 2S, this is our familiar splitting, the same type of splitting that we saw for hydrogen and lithium, right? So you're gonna have these 2S orbitals coming together, mixing together to form a sigma star 2S and a sigma 2S bonding orbital. And what we talked about in the last video, when we have p orbitals come together, we have this splitting. So when the boron 2p orbitals come together, we form a sigma 2p bonding orbital uh, and two pi, uh, pi 2p bonding orbitals and their antibonding equivalents up top, right? So for boron, its electron configuration is helium, 2s2, 2p1, right? So we got three, uh, three electrons in both of these free atoms. So we'll fill those, these guys in here, right? We got three electrons on both sides. So that means for our molecular orbital diagram, we are going to have to fill in six electrons in the MO diagram. So let's put two paired here, two paired here, and then two paired here. Right, so those are our six electrons. Now, if I were to ask you, is this material paramagnetic or diamagnetic, you would look and see, okay, well, in the MO diagram, we don't have any unpaired electrons, so this must be a diamagnetic material. Right, since we have no unpaired electrons, this material would be diamagnetic. Except there's one problem here. Experimental evidence shows that B2 is actually a paramagnetic material. So B2 is known to be paramagnetic. It's known to attract 
um, or to be affected by an applied magnetic field. So what gives? What's wrong with our MO diagram model? Well, there's one assumption that we're making here that is untrue. So the assumption that we're making is that the S and P orbitals mix separately. So we're saying here that the S orbital mixes with the S orbital and the P orbital mixes with the P orbital. That's true by and large, that's the largest mixing interaction, but it's not the only mixing interaction. So what we'll have here in the case of B2 and a couple of other molecules that I'll specify is a phenomenon known as SP mixing. So in this molecule, in B2, SP mixing occurs, which means that the S orbitals actually mix a little bit with the P orbitals, right? So we, it's not just a clean, here's the MOs from the S orbital, here's the MOs from the P orbitals. There's actually a little bit of mixing. Lucky for us, the diagram doesn't change that much. So you would think if there's SP mixing, maybe there's you know different lines going all over the place on the MO diagram, but not so. What's actually going to happen is just that these two orbitals, well, I should say these three molecular orbitals are going to switch energy ordering. The S and P mixing is going to raise the energy of the sigma 2P a little bit and decrease the energy of the pi 2P a little bit. So let's erase these guys here and redraw this. So what's going to happen here is that the 2p orbitals are going to be lower in energy. So you're going to have pi 2p, pi 2p, and the sigma 2p is going to be raised a little bit in energy. Right? So this is a result of sp mixing because the s orbitals and p orbitals in certain uh, molecules are close enough in energy, they actually mix with one another and cause this separate energy ordering, right? So now that we have uh, we have the right energy or, or well, now we have this different energy ordering, let's see what the MO diagram is going to look like, right? So we, we still have these four electrons unchanged. Two are going to be in the sigma 2s, two are going to be in the sigma star 2s. But now that we have these pi 2p orbitals next in the energy ordering, uh, we're actually going to put one electron here and one electron here. Reason why we do that is the same reason we do it in free atoms, right? So in atomic orbitals, the lowest energy electron configuration is gonna be the one that maximizes the number of unpaired electrons. Same thing here, right? So instead of pairing them in one pi 2p orbital, you're going to actually distribute one in each of these pi 2p orbitals. So now we actually do have unpaired electrons. So this guy is not diamagnetic, it is paramagnetic. And that actually fits with our, uh, with the experimental observation that B2 is paramagnetic. Okay, so where else will you get this energy ordering? So this energy ordering happens in C2, and it happens in N2. So for B2, C2, and N2, this uh, SP mixing is significant and it's going to affect this energy ordering. Now, when you get to O2 and F2, right? So when you get to O2 and F2, this is going to revert back to the original energy ordering. So in, in O2 and F2, the pi 2p is going to be greater in energy than the sigma 2p. But in C2 and N2 and B2, uh, you're going to have the sigma 2p greater than the pi 2p. Everything else stays exactly the same. All the other orbitals remain unchanged. The sp mixing only affects these orbitals, the sigma 2p and the two pi 2p orbitals. Right. So um, so those are the only two. Those are the only cases where you have to worry about this different um, this different ordering. Now, does that mean that no SP mixing is occurring in the in O2 and F2? No, there is SP mixing, but it's not significant enough to change this ordering of the orbitals. Right. So even though there is SP mixing in all cases um, in 
O2 and F2, it's not significant enough to change the energy ordering um, like it is in B2, C2, and N2. Okay, cool. So that is paramagnetism and a little bit of a primer on, you know, how to build these full molecular orbital diagrams for, you know, for atoms that contain S and P orbitals.